We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Since this month was declared as the month to focus on Christ um, for divine assistance and direction, I chose to speak along the line of the words of God from the mouth of our Archbishop, Her Grace, Dr. Margaret Benson Idahosa. Um, first Sunday, I spoke about help is on the way, which is all in line with that prophecy. The Sunday afterwards, I spoke about angels on guard, talking about the fact that God uses angels as our helpers, right, to bring us divine assistance and direction. Okay, and while I was teaching about angels, I, uh, you know, veered off for a few minutes and began talking about human angels and why you must honor people to bring about the manifestation of angelic traffic in your life. So this morning, I want to just teach more on that, all right? The center of my teaching is that there is no small person. As a matter of fact, small people can do significant things in your life. And you would never get help from God if you dishonor and disrespect people. Because truly speaking, nobody is a nobody. Can you say that with me? Nobody. Isaiah 60 verse 22, I take my text from there. Scripture says... A little one shall become a thousand. All right? Keyword little. But that you are little does not mean you cannot multiply. A little one shall become a thousand. So we are not saying there are no little people. It even says that a small one will become a strong nation. So that somebody is small today that somebody is small as an individual today does not change the fact that they can grow up into a nation, not just a community now, but a nation. And so you must understand the significance of small people, all right? You must learn how to respect and honor people. You must learn how to do things for people who cannot pay you back today. Because that they cannot pay you back today does not take away the possibilities of tomorrow. Luke 14 from verse 12. As a matter of fact, as a mature Christian, when you do something for people, don't do it because you are expecting that they will grow up tomorrow and pay you back. As a matter of fact, the people you help many times will not be the ones. Because the Bible says that you will reap what you sow, not where you sow. I said that before. So when you do something for somebody, forget about it. Your own blessing will come from somewhere else. But when somebody helps you, don't forget about it. You didn't hear that. Okay, let's go into this. Luke 14 from verse 12, Jesus speaking. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makes dinner or a supper, don't call thy friends or thy brethren or thy kinsmen or even thy rich neighbors. Why? Because they would also bid their own dinner again and invite you and make a recompense to you. But, verse 13, but when you make a feast, go and call those who will not have the opportunity to pay you back. It says, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. That's, all right, that's both literal and figurative. And thou shalt be blessed. Why will thou be blessed? Because they cannot do what? Recompense thee. Meaning, that your biggest blessings, all right, your biggest aid, your biggest acts of charity 
happens when you do it to somebody that you are not expecting back anything from. That is when God owes you. Right? Anybody I give and I know that the person will give me back, that's a transaction. But when I give someone I'm not expecting anything from, he says God owes you. They can't pay you back. And when you start living your life like that, that is when you are a truly big person. Truly big people treat every other person big. Small people make you feel small. Small people like to play down on you and make you feel small so that they themselves can feel better. When somebody is trying to make you feel little, it is because of who they are. If you are truly large at heart and you are big inwards, you will make every other person feel the same way. Let's see what James has to say about this. And we practice this a lot in this church. James chapter 2, let's start from verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory with respect of persons. Meaning, don't have respect of persons. If I respect somebody so extremely well and I treat the next person like nothing, that's respect of persons. Don't have respect of persons. If they're coming to your church, a man well-dressed, gold rings and apparel, and they're also coming to your church, a poor man, dressed scantily. Next verse, please. Don't have respect to him that is wearing the flashy clothes and say to him, sit on the front seat, sit in the good place. And then tell the poor person, go and stand at the back or stay here under my footstool. Are you seeing scriptures? That's why in this church we don't have a special seat. The reason why pastors sit in front is for the sake of order, so that we pass information. It is not because they are more special. Just anybody sits anywhere if they come that early. Nobody has an inheritance. All right, you know, that's your own chair. Go ahead, let's read this. Because if he said, if you are doing that, are you not partial in yourself? You have become judges of evil thoughts. Continue, please. How can my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and the heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? Keep going. But you have despised the poor. That's why rich men also oppress you and draw you before judgment seats. Continue. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law, what is the ro royal law according to scripture? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as what? Thyself. You do well. What we see happening is that even people who are a little bit above another in the social strata, try to oppress the person who they are just one step ahead in the ladder of poverty. It's like a one-eyed man bragging to a blind person that you cannot even see. People just look for what they will use in showing that they are better than somebody else. And business people have jumped in on that, all right, to cash out. So, because you would always want that one that seems not so common, that your neighbor cannot afford, so you will spend the next money that you don't have to impress people that you don't like. What's in verse 9? It's clear. If you have respect to persons, you commit what? Sin. Scripture. Not being legalistic. All right? If you have respect to a person, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Okay? If you have respect to a person. All right? And that is why church is a classless community. It's only in church that you will find elderly people and young people worshiping the same God. 
you will find the rich and the poor lifting up holy hands. There is absolutely no social strata in church. When we come before God, we are all Christians. Should I change the message? Disrespecting people is ignorance. You have seen the best of the rich man. You have not seen the future of the poor man. God does big things through small people. Think of small people a lot. God does big things through them. The big man you are trying to meet to give you a chance in life has a driver who sits with him in the same car. But the driver is too small for you to greet. You are trying to get audience with somebody for five minutes, but he rides in a car alone with a lowly driver for two hours. What if that driver just chips in the world for him while driving now, oh God, I know that man, a good man. People have gotten breakthrough that way. But you despise the small person and you are trying to reach the big person, in quotes. And that's why, you know, I have told ladies before, if you want to get married, don't look for a guy who, a, a guy who is nice to you. Look for a guy who is nice. Meaning, somebody can be nice to you and treat every other person poorly and you are comfortable. You don't understand life. So, it is not about how he opens the door for you to get into the car because, of course, he has a self-seeking interest. It should be more about how did he treat the waiter? How did he talk to the security man at the entrance? Because nobody is a nobody. A guy cannot be treating you like a queen and be physically abusing his own sisters, even if they are younger. Because the day they will leave home and there will be nobody else for him to beat. Guess who the next clients will be? Some people, the peace you are enjoying now is just because there is no other person left. You understand? The peace you are enjoying now is because, you know, there are other people that the person is still leeching on. That's why I, I, I like, um, what's that? That was Rachel in the Bible. Okay? When Abraham sent his servants to go and look for a wife for his son, Isaac, the servants prayed, say, God of my master Abraham, help me find a good wife for his son Isaac. And when Rachel came to fetch water from the well, he prayed that, let me not only find the person who will give me water, but the person who will also say, let me fetch for your camels too. So it wasn't about Rachel giving him water from the well to drink. It was about Rachel also fetching water for all the camels. And you know camels drink a lot for them to get satisfied in their thirst, that was how he judged. Imagine, imagine the little test with which Rachel came into the lineage of faith, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Rachel could have ignored the servants, or better still, fetch water for him and say, ah, is I can't, so how can I, all right? How can I give water to all this camel? Am I, am I an irrigation practitioner, you know? And that was it. She would have missed out on meeting and getting married to Isaac. It is not just about how people are nice to you. It should also be about how they are nice to others. If not, it will be something called eye service. Never look down on anybody. Not even the security man. You must honor, it shows how, how you are in your own self. You know there is an advantage of being a security man. 
You don't want me to tell you, so I will not. If you ask me, the security man in any business is the person that knows everybody who has come in. So when you come at the gates and they tell you organo day, if a guy is around, he knows. If a guy is not around, he is the one that knows. They pass through him at the gates. If you have been too nice to him, he will tell you, okay, I'll say him and tell you, say no day. <laughs> the point is, don't despise people. Even when you want to give money to your security man, put it in an envelope. That is how organized and how respectable you are. What about your house help? I don't like a situation where if I just step into a house without anybody telling you, you will just know that this one is the house help. There is always a sharp contrast between the house help and the children. Personally, I believe if I cannot give a house help the same quality of life and education I would love to give my children, then I would get one that does not live in. You get what I mean? Meaning come, walk, and go, and I pay you off. You do whatever you want to do with that. But if you live in my home, all right, you know, you should be like the elder brother or elder sister of the children. There's a celebrity lady I know who does that. She brandishes a house help on social media. And it's, you know, it's inspiring. Of course, I know that there are some small people who, when you try to be nice to them, they would even be the one persecuting you. I, I understand that, but I am telling you how to act in your own self based on who you are. You understand? I've had a secretary before because she knew all of my PIN and password and those transactions for me. She was stealing for me at a point. I didn't know until when I went to the bank, I saw multiple transactions. They said, you know, that transfer one, so I didn't know. I would just see, you know, small, small money, 2,000, 5,000 left. In my mind, the bank is just making money off me, no problem. One day, I got angry, and I went to the bank. They said, you have, you've been the one transferring, and I saw her name. I called her. You just saw from my account this seven or eight times. She said, no, I can swear on my late father's grave. I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I felt bad. How can I... Okay, and then somebody walked in and said, you know what, why don't you ask her to go and print your, your account statement? And I said, it doesn't matter. The person took it upon himself and said, don't worry, leave this to me. And the person called somebody else and acted like a security officer and called the girl and, you know, and the girl began to talk to the guy and confess and all of that. So things like that happen, Right? But did that, should that stop me as an individual from treating people nicely? No. Meaning that I am not saying you should bring down your guard and be less security conscious. I am not saying that you should open your homes to people without vouching for them first. But I am saying in your own self, do not be the person that will treat other people poorly. Praise God. Let me show you a story. Second Kings chapter 5 from verse 1. There is a man called Naaman. Naaman was the captain of the Syrian army. He was an honorable man. Through him, God has given deliverance to the Syrians. But this man, Naaman, had a problem... And the Bible was clear that even though he was a mighty man, this guy was a what? He was a leper. So he had leprosy. But meanwhile, his army had gone out and had brought company and brought captive from the land of Israel a little maid, just a little girl. And this girl became the, the house help to his wife. All right? So she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, it was this little girl that they brought captive from um, Israel 
that gave him privileged information. She said to her madam, her mistress, how I wish that my ogre would go to see the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Small people giving information that can change a life. Show me verse 4. And one went in and told the Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is from the land of Israel. Jump to 9, please. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots, stood at the door of the house of Elisha, saying, Elisha sent a message unto him, saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times. So Elisha was the prophet the little girl told him about, or told his wife to tell him about. Go and wash yourself seven times. Your flesh will become clean again. Eleven. Naaman was angry and went away. Pride. Are you seeing? He was a leper, but he had ego. Are you saying, you know, there is a direct relationship between your humanity and your humility. If you remember you are a human being, you will be humble. In all you do, remain, your pride is your loss. Keep being human. You see all of these airs people are trying to create around them. Or trying to make it more inaccessible for people to reach you and all of that. Listen, you are a human being. You will never survive life alone. So he was angry. He went away and said, I thought the prophet will come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. I have the leprosy and recover me of the leprosy. Name my knows how to heal the sick. That, see the way he is explaining the healing. Okay, if you, if you know so well how it is done, all right, you should have healed yourself. And that's how many people are. Because you just feel you are better than the person you should be listening to. You understand? How, 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 can, how can that person be the one that will be my leader? Because really, you, you have better resources or you have a better place in, but there are some things God will never do in your life without routing it through people that you seem to despise. So you must be careful about the people you despise because they might just be the next step to your next level. Are not Abban and Fapa, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? I should go and wash in those cleaner rivers and be clean. So he turned and went away in a rage. Go ahead. And his servants came near, servants, came near and spake unto him and said, my father, you know, he's no longer boss now. Now my father is a nice way of saying, let me give you some sense. Because they are his servants. So they called him, all right, let, assume I'm talking to him now as your child. If the prophets had told you to do something greater, will you not do it for the sake of your health? How much then did he say, go and wash and be clean? 14, please. Then he went down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a what? Little child, and he was what? This miracle began from the information that was given by who? The little slave girl. Now, I am thinking, what if his wife was not nice to the girl? Not even as an act of wickedness, she would be so scared of her that she won't say a word. And that is how many people have even lost information from their children too. See, if anybody accuses me of anything, nobody can accuse me of pride. It should be like that. There is, you understand, last two Saturdays I went to speak somewhere. It was a community. It was a, it was a real village. Do you know what they call village? I didn't see any house there that is not mud house. You understand? And, and when I lifted up my hands, all right, before I began speaking, the Holy Spirit said to me, when I make you big, will you still be small enough to come to places like this? The word, you know, I spent 
seconds meditating on that, I, was, I searched my heart. And all I could say was, help me, Lord. I don't want to be bigger than any soul you want to reach because every soul is worth the blood of Jesus Christ. You understand? At that point, my message changed. Whatever I was going to say changed. All right, that place was so much of a forest, so driving through it, you won't see, it's like a bushy path, you won't see any soul there and all of that. You know, when I was about to leave, you could see how the light came to the community. The, the chief of the community came to me, he, you know, he brought a seed, they were, and all I was thinking about was, if I was, if I was a Chris or Yakilome, would I want to come here? If I was, if I was an Idahosa, would I want to come here? Now, the sooner or, 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 or the speed at which I answered that question in my own heart is the speed at which I would also get there. Because God will take you so high if he is sure you can stoop so low. You understand? All of this thinking that people feel that, you know, you would just become, all right, you will become big and you will be floating up there and you won't reach down to people of low estates, you are mistaken. If a leader tells me the top is lonely, I will suspect that the person climbed up alone. If you tell me the top is lonely, that means you created bubbles that you live in. Because as you are climbing... You must not lose touch with other humans. Are you saying? So, as a gospel minister, that was saying on social media the other, the other week, all right, there are places where they will invite you to and you just go free-spirited and speak. You are not asking for an Arabian. You understand? Of course, there are people who are worth it and you know they will do something really good. You understand? But when you see small people, I saw a picture of Pastor Ia Deboye, he went to speak in a place that was maybe as small as this, you know, a hot kind of church. They invited him and he went there. You understand? It's not, you are not going there for an Arabian. You are going there because this is how you were when God called you. I've been to places to go and preach and after sweating, they will tell you, you know, we can't pay you for the word of God. As soon as they tell you that, just know you'll be trek home. Don't, don't, even start, don't even start thinking about it. Okay? And, and, and every time that happens, I know God is testing me. I know God is testing me. I am not that spiritually that. So I smile. You understand? If you bless me, thank you. If you don't, there is a bigger reason for coming. See, you must think like this. Okay, you must think like this. Let me tell you what Peter said. You know what Peter said? First Peter 2, verse 17. You know what Peter said? Peter said, honor some men. Come on, talk to me. He said, honor what? Now, now, you know, the Bible is a balanced book. It's not contradictory. All right? James said his own. Okay, Paul will say it, Peter will say it, Jesus will say it. He says, on, this is the mantra of a man, honor all men, love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the king. That last line is the part Christians don't do, they insult the president and they think it's funny. You understand? Honor all men. Okay? Honor all men. 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 Including your children. Because your children are in lower estates to you. And as a parent, it's easy to ignore them. Honor all men. Inc- your children include all men. Are, are, are they not human beings? Wait, am I, am I, is something wrong with me? Am I thinking alone? Honor all men. You know what Paul wrote to the Ephesians? He said, he said, um, um, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, right? Honor your father and your mother. This is the only commandment with a word, a promise. When you go to verse 4 of that Ephesians 6, you will see the part we don't read. It says, for you parents, where is it? For some reasons, he wrote that to fathers specifically. The Bible is a spiritual book. 
He didn't say you father and mother for some reasons because some fathers have become terrorists in their home and you think you are a man that when you come, everybody quakes. Okay? When you come in, there's tension. When you come in, everybody takes off and hide. You understand? He says, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. I tell parents, you have three stages with your children. All right, somebody said this and it's true. The first stage you have with your children, stage one, you are in charge and they are powerless. So they are still children. Daddy, I want to eat rice. You say no. Um, eat whatever is available. You are in charge. Stage two, you will be in charge and they will also be in charge. They will grow up. When you talk, they will protest. Go to this school. You say, no, I want that school. I won't pay for you and me, so I don't want to go to school. You know what I'm saying? You, stage two, they are in charge and you are in charge. At that point, you don't order them. You negotiate. Are you there? So everybody must compromise. Okay, go to this one because you, you, know, you must give reasons. And, and that's how to bring up children. You see, you know, who was I saying? Was it my wife? I said, you don't tell children what to stop doing. You tell them something else to do. You don't tell a child, don't jump on the chair. Tell him, jump on the bed. You understand? They must surely do something, so give them something else to do. But don't just stop them from what they want to be doing. Okay? So stage three, the children are now in charge. You are now powerless. Then you are old. And how you treat them growing up is how they will take care of you then. You are now old and powerless. You say, ah, I want to eat rice. Say, no, not bad day. Chop like that. <laughs> if you have too much energy, you are going to do it yourself. So I'm trying to say the small children you are seeing now running up and down, you better also honor them and respect them. Treat them nicely. Be careful how you treat a child. That child will grow. Some of you here have not forgotten somebody that mistreated you when you were a child, isn't it? Oh, imagine. Can you imagine? Okay? Some of you are still looking forward to when you will find that teacher one day. In your mind, he is now a beggar on the streets. And you are not driving your fine car. You are not born again. Okay? You better not... <laughs> Did you know that your children are not your property? I mean, you don't own your children. I saw this with what God did with Job. Show me Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 from verse 2. I want to show you something there. Job chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. And there was born to Job, how many sons? Seven. How many daughters? Three. Now, verse 3, please. Now, his substance, what he owned. He owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and all of that. Okay? Sheep, 7,000. Remember that. Camel, 3,000. Oxen, 500. This was his substance, what he owned. God and Satan negotiated about Job's property. All right? And then Job was afflicted. Do you know the story? Now, see the end of this man. Chapter 42, go to verse 12. And God blessed Job at the, end, at the later end of his life, more than the beginning. Show me the verse before this. I'm looking for a word. Go to verse 11 first, first off. I'm sorry. I want to see what's there, please. Okay, that's not it. I'm sorry. Go back to 12 now. Now, Job... Okay, had more at the, be at the end than his beginning. How many sheep did we see before? 7,000 if you were following my class. Now it's how many? 14,000. How many camels did we see before? 3,000. Now it's how many? How many yoke of oxen before? 500. Now it's how many? How many she asses? Now it's how many? Did everything double? Go to the next verse. God told him he was going to double everything he had. But guess what? How many sons did he still have afterwards? 
and how many daughters, God told him he was going to double everything he has. And all of the sheep, the camel, the she asses, all right, we are doubled, but something remained constant. What was that? The children, because he didn't have this one. Because God told him he would double everything that he owns, that he lost. He also lost his children, but their number was not doubled, meaning that God did not consider his children as part of his belongings. Because for every child, God gives you as a caretaker. If you respect the giver, you will value the gifts. As I close, let me show you something I saw as a teenager. And people talk about this a lot today in Christian circles. Dominion, dominate. All right? When God said that we should dominate, Genesis 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. After our what? Likeness. Are you in church this morning? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Right? Now, let that man have what? Now, what is the man supposed to have dominion over? Let him have dominion over what? The fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Did you notice something? God asked man to have dominion over all the animal. Have dominion over the earth, meaning have dominion over nature. But there is only one thing God did not ask man to have dominion over. He did not ask man to have dominion over his fellow man. Are you seeing? He said have dominion over the fish of the sea. Touch the skin of the person close to you and check if they have scales. Is anybody by your side a fish? Oh, yes. I can't pastor fishes. I don't. Jindu is their pastor. Okay. Um, over the fowl of the air, look around and find me feathers. Okay. Anyone? Not eyelashes. I said feathers. Okay. And then over every creeping thing. Does your neighbor creep? What kind of church is this? Eh? <laughs> so the point is that God asks man to have dominion over everything except his fellow man. If you understand that, you will know the boundaries of your dominion. You know there are some people who are only free in a friendship when they are the one who dominates in the conversation. They are always mute, except they dominate. That's like thinking you have something to say that every other person should shut up and listen to. You understand? Superiority complex is as bad as inferiority complex. Inferiority complex, you think you are not good enough. That's bad. And many people like that need to grow up. Superiority complex, you think you are really good. You just think you are the best in the world. That's pride. Pride can come in different forms. As I'm teaching now, there is somebody probably listening to me who is thinking, this thing George is saying, are you even sure these other people are understanding? That's pride. <laughs> you know, uh, because it comes in a subtle way. You are thinking that you, you have a good intention. But the fact that you think you are the only one who is getting it. All right? Or the fact that you think that there is no one else. That's what happened to, was he Elijah or Elisha? He went to God. He said, Jezebel has killed all your prophets. I'm the only one left. God said, really? I have 7,000 more who have not bowed down to bow. When you keep thinking you are the only one, that, that's pride. Okay? Don't dominate your fellow man. When they say have dominion, have dominion over the works of your hand. Have dominion over nature. Don't have dominion, all right, over your fellow man. And, and your spouse is your fellow man. 
You understand? Your wife is your fellow man in this context. Okay? Scripture never said you should dominate her. When, go and read Ephesians 5. Well, when the Bible says wives, submit to your own husband, you're right. Somewhere there he also said, submit to yourself, so one to another. You understand? So you submit to your husband, your husband too will submit to you in some things. So many men will manage their money better if they submit the finances to their wives. Okay? But when you keep on thinking that for some reasons, you know, you know better in everything. You know better in some things, not everything. If not, God will allow you to do life alone. Praise God. You must treat people right. Now, if I'm talking about treating people right, you know, that means I expect that by now you treat yourself right. You understand? Because people would carry you or, or, or see you or treat you as much as you treat yourself. You understand? How you present yourself, okay, they would value you at the rate of what you think you deserve. So let me say this to you and I end this conversation. No matter the issue you have with a particular parent, never hit on a child. If you do that, you are a small person. If you quarrel with the mother, don't see the baby and you roll your eyes at them in an angry way. If you have an issue with somebody's father, don't hit on the child. Are you there? You must be big enough. The child is not in the equation. You know, somebody last month was hospitalized. And um, last month, I did an experiment. I told my wife I wasn't going to answer any financial request from anybody. So I began to write the list of all those who were asking me for money that month. On my list, and I have about 12 in one month. Okay, so, uh, and that is how it always comes. But there was a particular woman right, I, I did something for a hospital bills, and I was telling, all right, someone that when she used to quarrel with my mother, okay, they would fight and curse at each other, yet she would carry me as a baby. You understand? That has been big at heart, okay? I was surprised last year on my birthday, she called me as old as she, she remembers, I don't know her birthday, I don't know about her, but she remembers my birthday. Okay, so I said to myself, you know what, I, I, you know, I will be responsible for her to some extent. What I'm trying to say is, never hate on a child. Because that child will grow. And you know, these children in this generation, they are seeing, you know, you might not remember what happened when you were five. There are children who are nine who can tell you what happened when they were four. They will tell you clearly. All right, that day you beat me with slippers. They will tell you, <laughs> okay? They will tell you. Maybe that will be the day you now came to beg them. You know, they, I'm just saying, you know, be wise. You understand? They don't forget things. Never hate on a child. As, as, as a matter of fact, never hate anybody you don't know personally. You understand? You are, you are, you, you are being small doing that. See, I'm I, I not just like that woman. Uh, why not? I don't even know. <laughs> okay. You just see somebody from afar, and you just assume that this person, the way he looks well fed, he has a proud look. I don't like him. He's proud, like Jindu. You know? <laughs> the way he just looks, he looks, he looks proud. In short, I hate him. And you don't know him personally. You understand? And people do that. When you catch yourself like that, you are really the small people we are talking about. The others should treat right. You are not big enough yet. And you must grow up. Praise God. You must grow up. You must grow up. No, nobody is beneath anybody. You see all those stories they used to say that in heaven, somebody will have a mansion. Somebody else will have a face me, I face you. I, I hope you know it's a lie. I, I don't know if Dangote supplies men to heaven. There's nothing like that. Okay, because you are thinking in heaven, you will not have class. 
you understand? So my mansion will now be by this person's mansion and all of that, you, you will be shocked. Okay? In heaven, the houses God is talking about are, 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 are people, me and you. You understand? Yes, yeah, scripture says you are God's building. Okay? You are God's building. That's what Paul was the Corinthians. All right? And Peter said as lively stones. So God is using us to build. There is no class there. Okay? There is no class there. Show me John 14 verse 1. John 14 verse 1. Let me show you something I saw. Okay, okay. Are you there? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me too. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's the scripture people use to think. Somebody even, I had the story, somebody who had a revelation that in his mansion, all right, the roof was leaking in heaven. He woke up from, from, this, from sleep crying. And then they said it's because he didn't pay his tithes for last month. Those of you who don't pay tithes, your own, the, the zinc will rust. You get what I'm saying? So. <laughs> but listen, if you look at this well and, and you, you went to school, in my father's house are many mansions. How can mansions be in a house? You have not even seen that. So it will take you five seconds. Some of you, when you are going home, you now say, okay. So, so whatever we think he's saying, there's no what he's actually saying. You understand? In my father's house, I mean, think about it. It's like saying, in this, my bedroom, there is a duplex. You, you understand? Something is wrong somewhere. <laughs> okay? So, the point we are making is that that's not what you are thinking. But let me, that's a subject for another day. If something happens, and you are now the one taking care of your aged parents, by all means, don't be rude to them. You understand? And parents, don't plan your life in such a way that you are expecting your children to be your retirement plan. They might not come home. You must plan your life in such a way whereby you have businesses and investment that will be taking care of you. It is, it is average thinking to be thinking that when you grow old, your children will take care of you. Now, we do that for our own parents, but you don't end your life like that, too, because things will get harder then. You understand? Things will get harder then. I have an entire message for that, so let, let me leave it. You know, culture has spoiled us a lot. The Bible actually said a good man leave it inheritance for his children, children's children. But African culture makes us think, you know, you are the one the children should take care of when they should be living for you. You understand? I'm looking around if you're elderly people here who will get angry. But I'm just telling you how we should be scripturally. But if you are the one taking care of your aged parents, okay, you must not be rude. You must still honor them. There is a place for that. You understand? But as you are honoring them with your seed, trust God that your own children would not have to be that stressed because you will make better choices. So the summary of it all is honor all men, respect people. It doesn't cost you a thing to say good morning with a smile. Listen, some of you here, ladies, you have met people who... Oh, yeah, remove it now. Okay, you're distracting me. I know I'm handsome. Remove it. Okay. If you say no, I will call you out. You have met people who like you. All right? As a lady, you have met a guy who adores you, and he's treating you right, but you are messing up. You are not reciprocating kindness. You understand? Because you are expecting that they will always be there. Say you are married. You. Let, let me just say this. Hmm? If somebody is treating you nicely, all right, you don't have any rights to treat the person poorly. You can actually lose good people. You understand? There are seasons in life when you are in your 20s, 
okay? And anywhere you look, you will see a guy who has an interest in you. It is not because you are the prettiest. It is because you are in a season of life. You can get into a season and do the best makeup on earth and nobody will talk to you. You understand? So you must be nice to the person who is nice to you. Because some of you have met people who, all right, you should actually marry them. Okay? But motivational speakers have told you that um, um, you should not marry at first sight. How do they say it again? You know? So you are, you are trying to see, okay, let them keep coming and keep coming. You must make your choice and make it fast. If somebody is not physically abusive, he is not a liar, all right, and, 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 and he is God-fearing, that's all you want, okay? You can't know everything about the person you will end up marrying. Those of you who want to date forever, okay? You, you, if you date for 10 years, the day you marry the person, you, you will see a side of the person you never knew existed. You get what I'm saying? I remember when I first took my wife out, I told her, eat, she said, I'm not hungry. We were dating there. Now she eats five times a day. When, <laughs> I'm sorry. When she's happy seven times, you know, it's, it's by eight o'clock and then by nine, you would just say, I'm hungry. The first day I thought it was a joke, okay? The first day that happened, I thought she was joking, but now it's my reality so that if you know, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior.